Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be totaling up some of our Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit The Girl Who Cried Monster. This is a book I remembered well, largely because there's just not a whole lot of plot to remember. The girl sees the librarian turn into a monster, and then just keeps on spying on him. That's it. It also has a terrible twist ending too, which I remembered clearly. When looking at the original cover, it's another one I really like. I've always been a fan of the ones that have a lot going on. This one's no exception. I like that there's a little horrified Lucy lurking in the back while Mr. Mortman eyes himself a tasty looking fly. Also, for fun, here's a picture of Jacobus posing as concept art for the cover. The 2003 version moves away from the purple and goes blue instead, and I don't think this is a bad decision at all because the original cover is almost too purple, and the blue brings out some more contrast. There's no post-2008 version this week, because The Girl Who Cried Monster is the only book out of the original 10 to not get a reprint, so instead I'll show you how cool the French version looks. If you're interested in seeing what other countries' versions look like, you should check out my shorts that have been releasing on Mondays. As far as merchandise goes, there's a lot more than I thought there would be. We have the usual trading cards and this awesomely colored folder, but we also have another monster bag which I've learned since the Slappy episode is actually really cool. These bags contain like a monster figurine inside some slime, so that's way more interesting than I first thought. We also of course have another pog. Our front tag says she's got the monster of all problems. And yes she does, because this book doesn't shy away from showing you its monster, which is kind of fun. The back tag says she's telling the truth, but no one believes her. I guess we need this in case you didn't get that from the title already. Before we jump into our summary, let's read the blurb on the back. Lucy likes to tell monster stories. She's told so many that her family and friends are sick of it. Then one day Lucy discovers a real life monster, the librarian in charge of the summer reading program. Too bad Lucy's told so many monster tales, too bad nobody believes a word she says, too bad the monster knows who she is, and is coming after her next. Alright, now that that's over with, let's hop into our summary. This story opens similarly to Let's Get Invisible, where we get a hint at where this book is going on the first page and then jump back in time. This time we meet Lucy Dark, who is 12 years old, like our other protagonist, and is on her way to a monster home invasion. She lets us know right away that at some point in this story, a monster will be right in her house, and it's due to nobody believing her. Since the title is a play on the fable, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, this isn't particularly surprising. Old Lucy loves to tell tall tales about monsters, and especially loves torturing her younger brother Randy with them. For some reason we get a detailed description on the exterior of Lucy's home. Long story short, it's just an average house. We also of course get a detailed description of Lucy. He looks a lot like me, even though he's a boy. He's got straight black hair, just like me, only I wear mine longer. He's short for his age, like me, and just a little bit chubby. He has a round face, rounder than mine, and big black eyes, which really stand out because we both have such pale white skin. Mom says Randy has longer eyelashes than mine, which makes me kind of jealous, but my nose is straighter and my teeth don't stick out so much when I smile, so I guess I shouldn't complain. Lucy is feeling feisty and decides to pass the time with a monster story for Randy. This one stars the Timberland Falls Toe Biter, who happens to bite toes in case you were confused. Lucy may want to work on her monster names. Lucy tells the tale of one unfortunate girl who is relaxing by the pool when suddenly a toe biter munches off all her toes. My sister actually has a fear of fish and water for similar reasons. This freaks poor Randy out and leads to a very weird chapter cliffing or prank bro mashup where Lucy declares all of her toes on her foot are missing. They aren't of course, and she's just hidden them in the dirt. But this scares Randy anyways, who races towards the house hollering for help. Lucy is able to stop him by telling him that there is a tree monster, you guessed it, in the tree. Randy takes this as the gospel and continues to race inside. If Randy is this gullible, I can kind of see why he's so much fun to torment. Lucy claims the toe biter was one of my best creations. So that's where the standard lies for this story. Lucy explains the toes in the dirt joke once more just in case you were confused and says to herself, what a riot. As she's reflecting on her hysterics, she suddenly falls victim to a shoulder scare and her very first thought is a monster. But that monster just turns out to be her friend Aaron. Aaron lets us know that Lucy is truly obsessed with monsters. And as a side note, Lucy thinks obsessed is a big word. I'd have to agree, Lucy seems to have an unnatural interest in monsters, but given the twist in hindsight, it really isn't that strange. Lucy is surrounded by idiots because she quickly has Aaron convinced that there's a monster up in the tree, and he runs to grab a broom to poke at it. In a second chapter cliffhanger prank bro mashup, we have a monster falling from the tree and landing on Aaron's chest. I was expecting a cat scare, but instead it ended up being an old bird's nest that plopped out onto the boy. Later that day, she gets a lecture from her mom about constantly scaring her brother because she thinks she's probably going to do psychological damage to the simple boy at this rate. We also get this odd description of the mom. She has straight, shiny black hair, like Randy and me, and she has green eyes, cat eyes, and a small feline nose. Whenever mom starts in with one of her lectures, I always picture her as a cat about to pounce. Her mom sounds like deviant art. Lucy cranks up the angst by retorting, life is just a phase I'm going through. In response to concerns about her monster obsession, 
We then find out Lucy is late for the Reading Rangers, which is basically a read a book a week program hosted by Mr. Mortman at the library. I wonder if this book was before the reading rewards at Pizza Hut, because that was an awesome time to be alive. It's the early 90s, so Lucy rollerblades her way to the library. I grew up on a gravel road, so rollerblading and skateboarding were never in the stars for me. The town library sounds great though, because it's located in an old haunted house apparently. It was three stories tall, dark shingled, with a dark pointy roof between two stone turrets. The house was set back in the trees, as if hiding there. It was always in the shade, always dark, always cold inside. Stein gives a great description of Mr. Mortman. Mr. Mortman did his best, I guess, but he was kind of creepy too. The thing all of his kids hated the most about him was that his hands were always seemed to be wet. He would smile to those black beady eyes of his, lighting up his plump bald head. He would reach out and shake your hand, and his hand would be sopping. When he turned the pages of books, he'd leave wet fingerprints on the corners. His desktop always had small puddles on top, moist handprints on the leather desk protector. He was short and round, with that shiny bald head and those tiny black eyes. He looked a lot like a mole. A wet pod mole. The man needs to go to the doctor if he's leaving puddles everywhere. That can't be healthy. Also, I'm adding wet pod mole to my inventory of insults. Mr. Mortman is also a turtle enthusiast. Lucy fakes her way through some question on Huckleberry Thin and gets her gold sticker. She's somewhat pleased with the next selection of Frankenstein and plots about scaring Randy with it. As she's walking lost in thought, she realizes she forgot her rollerblades at the library and heads back. She's suddenly very creeped up by the library and sneaks around quietly. She pauses to define premonitions because it's a good vocabulary word before stumbling across Mr. Morphin. Lucy has peeping tom habits. I like spying on people. It's kind of thrilling. Even when they don't do anything very interesting. Just knowing that you're watching them and they don't know that they're being watched is exciting. We then get a witness a monster transformation. As he struggled to unscrew the jar lid, Mr. Morton's face began to change. His head floated up from his turtleneck and started to expand, like a balloon being inflated. I uttered a silent gasp as I saw his tiny eyes poke out of his head. The eyes bulged bigger and bigger until they were as big as doorknobs. Then the light from the window grew even dimmer. The entire room was cast in heavy shadows. The shadows swung and shifted. I couldn't see well at all. It was like I was watching everything through a dark fog. Mr. Morton continued to hum, even as his head bobbed and throbbed above his shoulders, and his eyes bulged out as if on stems, poking straight up like insect antenna. Then his mouth began to twist and grow. It opened wide, like a gaping black hole on an enormous bobbing head. Mr. Morton sang louder, an eerie, frightening sound, more like an animal howling than singing. The best line from that is clearly his enormous head bobbed and throbbed excitedly. Fetch me the smelling salts. Monster Mortman is munching down on handfuls of flies, and Lucy denies us the vomit count by covering her mouth to hold it in. After seeing this, Lucy quickly makes her escape from the library. Lucy has now found herself in quite the predicament, because of course she's the boy who cried wolf. Lucy is much braver than me though, because upon realizing she forgot her rollerblades in the library again, she decides to go back for him. She marches right up to the door, but this plan is quickly foiled by the library being locked. Lucy of course tries to tell her parents, but they're too preoccupied with making meatballs, and the only person who believes her is Randy, cause he'll believe anything. Lucy spends the chapter being annoyed and tries to plot how to convince her parents the man is a monster. We cut to a week later and Aaron is playing with the Throw-Yo. If you're confused, you've been missing out. Get ready to order Throw-Yo, the most amazing flying disc ever thrown. Flies like a disc, returns like a yo-yo. Toss Throw-Yo like any other flying disc. When it reaches the end of the line, a slight tug brings Throw-Yo right back to you. Amaze your friends with trick throws and catches. Beat the Throw-Yo around the world record of 11 passes and a catch at the end. Have your credit cards ready and call 1-800-221-4400. You must be 16 to order. Call now. Lucy has confided in him to no avail, but she has big plans for her next Reading Rangers meeting. At the meeting, she gets another gold star and grills Mr. Mortman on monsters. She then proceeds to hide in a bookshelf until closing so she can catch a glimpse of Monster Mortman. Her plan at this point is just to see him in monster form again, so she can confirm that she's not losing her mind. This plan fails somewhat as she gets locked inside the library, which she somehow didn't account for, even though it's literally closing time. Lucy gets her wish and watches Mr. Mortman transform and help himself to a jar of flies. I'm impressed he's able to get handfuls of flies to eat when I struggle just to kill one when they break into the house. He ups the ante and we think he's about to feed his turtle friend some flies when he pops the turtle in his mouth and chomps down on it. Lucy's seen enough and she loudly races to the door, but has forgotten that the front door is locked despite watching him lock it 10 minutes ago. Great work, Lucy. In a chapter cliffhanger, she's stuck at the door as Monster Mormon's footsteps comes towards her. Lucy suddenly realizes, wait, she does know how to operate a deadbolt and makes her escape, but not before Monster Mormon catches a glimpse of her. She stops by Aaron's house to have basically the same shouting about Monster's conversation she had with her parents a few chapters back. 
He doesn't believe her and she tells him to go, go find herself. Well, not really, but she's very disappointed in him. Once home, she tries to alert her parents, but they're off grocery shopping, so she heads into her room in a chapter clipping her surprise, a monster on her pillow. Nope, just Randy's latest art project. Good for Randy working on his trauma through art. As Randy is relishing in his revenge, Lucy hears her parents at the door. Or at least she thinks it's her parents, because once she gets there, and again in another chapter clipping her surprise, she sees Mr. Mortman. Lucy immediately tells him that her parents aren't home and then says to herself, I'm dead meat. Turns out Lucy had forgotten her backpack at the library, and he was just returning it. He's clearly investigating if it was Lucy, and she tries to stay calm but doesn't do a great job of it. He's somewhat convinced it wasn't her, and he leaves. Once her parents return, she tries to tell him about Monster Mortman, and they don't buy it. She eventually resorts to bribery and pays Aaron $5 to hide in the library with her. This quickly fails because Aaron skips town with the cash. Well, not really, he just goes to the orthodontist instead. Fun fact, my childhood orthodontist looked just like this man. I used to call him the Orange Man. Lucy suddenly has a better plan, which is to sneak in with a camera and catch him in the act with it. She heads off to the library to start her stakeout. We spend a lot of time in the library in this book. Someone is using a microfiche machine, and that just made me realize I've never used one and now I want to. They make me think of the early seasons of The X-Files. She hides behind a cabinet for an entire chapter and she runs through her plan, which really does not require this level of explanation. This book is a lot of filler. Finally, he transforms into Monster Mormon and helps himself to a jar of moths this time. Lucy snaps her picture, but her dumbass forgets about the Flash. This of course alerts Monster Mortman, and he roars angrily. The Flash has blinded him somewhat, so Lucy doesn't instantly get caught. She races through the aisles, trips over a book cart, but eventually makes her escape. This time she feels confident she hasn't been seen, despite her sloppy escape. Once home, we're treated to an entire chapter centered around getting Chinese food at the mall, while the photos develop. It's about as exciting as it sounds. Finally, when she gets her photos back, she sees that Monster Mortman has some vampire powers, because he's not visible in the photo she took of him. Her parents continue not to believe her, and we cut to the next evening with Lucy and Aaron doing a stakeout. I'm glad they decide not to hide in the library this time, and instead they stalk the man on his walk home. After a few pages of following him, he finally arrives at his house. Lucy ends up standing on a wheelbarrow in order to see inside the house. As she's updating Aaron on what she sees, in a chapter cliffhanger she's suddenly face to face with Mr. Morton in the window, but actually he doesn't see her because he's gazing into his fish tank instead. I'm pretty sure I would notice her freaking face in the fish tank. A monster Mormon transformation happens and he starts helping himself to his fish tank. He gobbles up some fish, a snail, and an eel like spaghetti as Lucy watches. She turns to have Aaron take a look but he's suddenly vanished. Turns out he was looking for something else to stand on, but when Lucy tries trading places with him, she of course loudly falls off the wheelbarrow. This catches Mortman's attention and he looks out the window at her. Aaron's already taken off so Lucy runs too. She doesn't get too far though because we have a chapter cliffing her shoulder scare with some follow through. This time Mortman actually gets a hold of Lucy by the shoulders. He quizzes her on why she was creeping outside his window, and she tells him that she was just checking to see if he was home so she could tell him that she's going to be late tomorrow for the Reading Rangers program. He urges her to come inside to use his phone, but Lucy says no thanks and takes off running. We are then treated to a third shoulder scare, this time by Aaron in the field. He reveals that he didn't see anything and that this whole little adventure has been for nothing, well other than getting Lucy caught. We only have like 10 pages left, so this has to go somewhere soon. The next day Lucy begs her mom to let her skip Reading Rangers, and her mom releases some pent up frustration. She turned to face me. Her expression was angry. The fact is, Lucy dear, that you are a quitter. You never stick with anything. You're lazy. That's your problem. Lucy ends up at the library and feels hopeful that she won't be slaughtered because there's other people present. She's not very bright though because she waits patiently for her Reading Rangers meeting to start as the library clears out. Once it's just her and Mr. Mortman, he locks the door and lets her know he knows everything. He transforms and he gets ready to end this book once and for all, but in a brief chase sequence he gets distracted when Lucy knocks over a card catalog and Monster Mortman has to stop and clean up the mess because... No, the monster howled. At first I thought it was a victory cry, but then I realized it was an angry cry of protest. With a moan of horror he stooped to the floor and began gathering up the cards. Staring in disbelief I plunged past him, running frantically, my arms thrashing wildly at my sides. In that moment of terror I remembered, the one thing that librarians hate the most having cards from the card catalog spilled onto the floor. Mr. Morthman was a monster, but he was also a librarian. He couldn't bear to have those cards in disorder. He had to try and replace them before chasing after me. It reminds me of this scene in one of my favorite X-Files episodes. Well, oddly enough, there seems to be one obscure fact which, in all the stories told by the different cultures, is exactly the same, and that's that vampires are really, really obsessive-compulsive. Huh. Yeah, you toss a handful of seeds at one, no matter what he's doing, he's got to stop and pick it up. If he sees a knotted rope, he's got to untie it. It's in his nature. In fact, that's why I'm guessing that our victim's shoelaces were untied. Yeah. 
obsessive. Like Rain Man. Oh, man. What'd you have to go and do that for? You are in big trouble. Then I was out cold. Thank God the X-Files isn't as strict as Goosebumps when it comes to copyright claims because in my world all things circle back to the X-Files. After Lucy makes her escape we have a surprise from Aaron. Turns out he was hiding in the library and saw the whole thing happen. Lucy is thrilled because she thinks her parents will have to believe her, now that another 12 year old claims to have seen a monster librarian. Lucky for Lucy I'm wrong and they do believe Aaron and they decide to have Mr. Mormon over for dinner to clear things up. We cut to a few evenings later and Mr. Mormon arrives for dinner in style. He was wearing lime green trousers and a bright yellow short sleeved sport shirt. I don't really get why he heads over to this house when he knows Lucy knows his secret. But that's the least confusing thing on this page though because once he's in the house having cheese and crackers suddenly. Mr. Mortman asked, what is for dinner? You are, Dad repeated. Old Mr. Mortman let out a little cry and turned bright red. He struggled to raise himself from the low couch. But Mom and Dad were too fast for him. They both pounced on him. Their fangs popped down, and they gobbled the librarian up in less than a minute, bones and all. Randy laughed gleefully. I had a big smile on my face. My brother and I hadn't gotten our fangs yet. That's why we couldn't join in. Yep, the whole family are monsters themselves, and there's only room for one family of monsters in this city. Whatever, it's certainly a twist and a stupid one at that. Okay, now let's look at the episode. This may have been the very first Goosebumps episode I remember watching as a kid. Like, I have a very clear memory of Mr. Mortman in monster form. I don't recall being scared though, just more fascinated. I think this episode's practical effects make it a special one. When checking the episode for interesting actors, I didn't really turn up a whole lot. Eugene Lubinsky as Mr. Mortman is the biggest actor here, and he's been in a lot of stuff, but not much of it was memorable for me besides for being on Fringe for a bit. Dan Lett as the dad is also fairly active as an actor, but once again nothing really that exciting except for that he will return as the voice of Rocky in Night of the Living Dummy 3. Right out the gate we get a commercial break at this attempted jump scare. Don't use your foot! Do it real quick. Ah! Oh! Get away! I appreciate little Randy's commitment to the role. Actually, the toe better gave me back my toes. Because I promised to cut yours off and give them to him tonight. No! Lucy? Lucy summons her inner Ebert and Roper. Well, what did you think? Two thumbs down. I like that they worked in Mr. Mortman's wet little hands into the dialogue. Aaron, you ever notice anything weird about Mortman? Like his creepy, beady little eyes. And his sweaty little hands. Also, this library looks really cool. They threw in a cheap cat jump scare that actually got me, and I like that you can tell that they literally just threw the cat into the scene. I think Mr. Mormon is effectively creepy with his old teeth chattering. Oh, aren't you hungry? Munch, munch. <laughs> The monster transformation is fun too. <laughs> this episode can be summed up in one clip. Don't you say hi anymore. Hi dad, there's a monster in the library. Stein was so proud of this line that it made its way into the episode. Oh, I hope this monster thing was just a phase you were going through. Life is a phase I'm going through! They have some pretty gross scenes for a kid's show, especially the spider chomping and the chase. Little 
one. I love fast food. <laughs> They should show this at elementary schools for stranger danger mistakes. Good evening, Lucy. May I come in for a minute? No. My parents aren't home right now. Mr. Mormon is good at playing creepy. You're quite the photographer. Mr. Mortman, what are you doing here? It's been so long since I've had a home-cooked meal. <laughs> I love that they just have a tray of meatballs for snacking. Offer Mr. Mortman a meatball. Hmm. Delicious. I like that the parents are snake monsters in the episode. That's right. You. You are. I get why this one left an impression on me as a kid. It has a lot of creepy scenes and the tone is weird as hell. I think I prefer the episode to the book on this one. I just really love Monster Mortman's buggy little eyes and his passion for insect snacks. Overall, I thought The Girl Who Cried Monster was just okay. I found myself wanting to skip ahead often in this book. I think it may have worked better as a short story because this one dragged even more than Say Cheese and Die. It gets points for having an actual monster who does monster gross things, but these are scattered throughout entire chapters of just dull repetitive information. I'm giving this one 3 out of 5 tasty little turtles. It was almost a 2, but the monster action kind of saves it. Alright, on to our Goosebumps totals. We don't have any It's Only a Dreams, but we did have a few shoulder scares to add to our count. There were a total of three shoulder scares in The Girl Who Cried Monster. The first one Aaron surprises Lucy in the yard, the second when Mr. Mortman grabs Lucy, and a third when Aaron grabs Lucy in the field after their escape. This brings our series total to nine shoulder scares. In Getting Jiggy with the 90s, we had six 90s moments. These included Disney Comics, Roller Blades, Super Nintendo, Throw-Yo, a Microfeast Machine, and card catalogs. This brings our series total to 52 Jiggy 90s moments. As far as asshole victims go, Lucy is kind of an asshole victim in her own way. She torments everyone around her with monster stories until finally one day she almost gets got. However, she never really suffers any consequences at the hands of Monster Mortman, so the series total is going to remain at 6 asshole victims. Bomb My Cat remains at 0, but Lucy comes close to puking when she watches Monster Mortman chomp down on a turtle. Spongy444 was kind enough to point out that Goosebumps Series 2000 had vomit in it, so maybe that's where these vomit thoughts are originally planted. Their total remains at zero. We had three It's a Prank Bros and The Girl Who Cried Monster. We had the Attack of the Toe Monster, the Bird Nest Monster, and the Paper Mache Monster on the bed. This brings us up to 13 It's a Prank Bros. The Girl Who Cried Monster had a total of nine chapter cliffhangers. Overall, these cliffhangers weren't terrible and they did the job. This raises our Goosebumps total to 106. The clunky cliffhanger award for this book goes to chapters one to two, where Lucy is telling us a made up story about a toe monster and we're suddenly supposed to think her toes are actually gone. Although I did consider doing the one where Lucy forgot how door locks work. Shocker ending. There was a monumentally stupid twist to this one where Stein decided to wrap this book up with the whole family being monsters and has the parents gobble up Mr. Mormon. It's completely out of left field and it doesn't match the tone of the book at all. This brings our shocker endings total to six. Well that's it for the girl who cried monster. Like I said earlier, this book would have worked better in a short story collection I think. I didn't hate it, it was just so-so. That twist was certainly something though. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on The Girl Who Cried Monster in the comments. Are you into turtle soup? How about voyeurism? Also, what did you think of my library clips? Anyways, thanks again for watching and make sure you subscribe for... The Pride. The Love. <laughs>